Well, hello everybody. It's a little after two o'clock, so we're gonna begin. We are the rankers here to talk to you about college rankings. And we're gonna start with just kind of a brief introduction of everybody who is sitting here on the stage with me, and then we will dive right into it. So my name is Katie Bardaro. I am the VP of Data Analytics at Payscale. And Payscale is a online compensation research firm. And the way that we're involved with rankings is by producing college rankings relative to outcomes or salary outcomes related to school and major choice. Hi, I'm Kim Clark, and I um, sort of am the main reporter for the Money College Rankings. Money, of course, is famous for its best uh, mutual funds and best places to live. And now we do also do best colleges. Best value colleges. Uh, hey, folks, Rob Franick from Princeton Review. I'm a senior vice president and publisher for uh, our retail publications with Random House and Penguin. I'm responsible for content up on our website for testing, admissions, financial aid, career services. And I've been writing a, a couple of college guidebooks for a long time. I'm an old time Princeton Review soldier, 16 years. Uh, and one book is called The Best 380 Colleges. Uh, so I'm hoping that we'll talk about some of the rankings in many of these publications today. Thanks. Uh, and I'm uh, Jordan Montadaira. I'm a professor at Cornell University and uh, am uh, joining the panel today uh, because of a past role. Um, uh, while uh, on leave from Cornell over the past couple of years, I served as chief economist for the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House. And uh, in that role, led uh, a cross-agency team in the production of the college scorecard um, uh, produced by the federal government. Uh, I'm required to say that the, the views that I'll talk about today are my own uh, and not those of the administration. <laughs> Good. All right. The other thing we wanted to share with you is we are going to leave time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, we are partnering with Slido. The information is here on the website about how you can log in, enter the hashtag SXSWEDU, select this location venue, and start an entering questions. There's also the ability to upvote questions, so we because we'll not be able to get through everything probably, so make sure and upvote the questions you want to make sure we address. So first, why talk about rankings? We all know that rankings are very prevalent in today's education world, and we're all here to kind of present to you what we do about rankings, what the intended and unintended consequences are, and, and kind of what the future landscape looks like. So let's start with a kind of a level set, college rankings then and now. A brief history of notable college rankings. US News kicked off this whole thing back in 1985, and they've been continuing to produce rankings and um, mostly focusing on inputs rather than outcomes. Money Magazine released America's Best College back in 1990. Princeton Review joined the game in 1993, and then Payscale joined it in 2008. And then lastly, the Department of Education released the college scorecard in 2015. Now let's talk about college rankings now. In terms of college rankings now, the things that we want to consider is the changes that have happened to the data inputs, to the calculations, and to all the different players who are in the game. OK, why don't we start with Rob then? Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure enough. Um, we've been focusing on rankings, as um, you can see in the slide, since 1993. We have been pretty unapologetic about going directly to whom we would consider college experts. And, and those folks, in our minds at Princeton Review, are current college students. Uh, we've been surveying hundreds of thousands of those students per year, asking them their experiences academically and otherwise, and putting those rankings into that book that I was talking about before, The Best 380 Colleges. Uh, and that is fully based on student opinion. There are 62 different top 20 ranking lists in, in, in that book. Um, and we have been vigilant about making sure that we're going to those students uh, for their experiences, again, inside the classroom and outside the classroom. We have morphed from there, and, and many of the things I think we're going to focus on today, talking about solving for students' fears and making sure that we are giving them resources to let them realize their, their hopes. And, and we've been surveying a ton of students at, at Prince Review, college-bound students. Uh, we work with a, a lot of students as well. Uh, last year, 1.4 million students came through uh, our queue at the Princeton Review. We take that number pretty seriously because it's one out of every two students that applies to college each year. So I'm, I'm grateful that they have placed so much uh, value in some of the guidance that we're giving them academically and, and otherwise. But I feel like many of those students are best served by listening to their cohort that came just before them and listening to those other, other folks. So I'm hoping that we can focus on those things and certainly the outcomes that come from there. Great. Yep. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, before I came to Money, I worked for 12 years for U.S. News and World Report, so I'm quite familiar with their rankings and, and how they how we have changed them. So U.S. News and World Report famously first started ranking just by um, surveying other college officials about what the academic reputation of other schools was. So that was the very first ranking was simply a prestige academic prestige ranking, and as the years went on, they started adding other uh, data points, but mostly inputs like how much money the college had or spent. And um, what happened in the last couple of years is we've developed more and more data about outcomes, which is actually what people care about, of course, more than inputs. And so money ranks our uh, colleges based on earnings and student loan repayment, as well as cost issues. As is mentioned here, you know, everybody knows the tuition prices have just risen crazily. So when college was very affordable, I think it mattered l less you, you, you had much more flexibility in, in deciding which college to attend, but if, if it's going to cost $100,000 or $200,000, suddenly you take the decision much more seriously and you have higher expectations about what you're going to get out of it. So we look at cost and outcomes. Great. And pay scale. And same thing with pay scale, we're focused on the outcome side of the equation. And so when we came to uh, the market in 2008 with earnings data, it was the first earnings data that was available tied to educational choices. And we saw that there was a fervor for this kind of data. People wanted to have an understanding of what potential outcomes could they get based off their educational choices, largely because costs were rising so quickly and student debt was becoming a real problem. So when we came out to the market, we came out with this outcomes data, and we've continued to work with multiple partners, including Princeton Review and Money Magazine, so that they can incorporate this outcomes data with the other qualitative factors and inputs to educational rankings. So now I'm going to pass the mic to Jordan. Um, does my, my microphone is working. Um, so I, as you know, there, there was a well-publicized effort for the, um, the Department of Education, um, kind of pushed by the White House, to get into the game of college rankings as well. So back in um, 2013, um, the president announced that the federal government was going to undertake this effort uh, to generate our own set of rankings uh, or rate college ratings to try to help to inform uh, students and families about uh, which institutions were providing the best value. And I think um, to really understand where that push was coming from, we kind of have to go back in time to the onset of the Great Recession. You had this explosion of uh, numbers of kids who were going back uh, to college, kids in, in both um, uh, continuing uh, adult students as well. Uh, and you started to see just an explosion in um, uh, kind of signs of distress related to that, uh, to that uh, uh, big increase in the number of students who are going to school. So the, the amount of federal uh, student loan debt outstanding almost doubled over the course of just uh, about six or seven years. Uh, the number of students defaulting on their loans was exploding over that time period. Uh, you had a lot of students who were coming out of school uh, sending the president letters um, that would kind of circulate through the staff about just the, the amount of um, hardship that students who had gone to college felt like they were doing everything right were really encountering out in the market. And um, really uh, kind of motivated by that, uh, the, the president uh, and others um, in the White House were feeling that there just wasn't enough information to help inform uh, students about the financial consequences of uh, the decisions that they were making. So that was a game that was rapidly changing at that point. So. Um, in, information like pay scale was starting to seep out more, more and so on, but still there was a feeling that we didn't have good uh, national level information that was available for the full range of uh, institutions of higher education, um, and uh, the federal government really had a role to play there as uh, an organization that really has the access um, to things like uh, the post-enrollment earnings uh, of the alumna of colleges, uh, through uh, tax records, things like um, student loan repayment rates, uh, and a lot of these other kinds of measures using the administrative data that um, the federal, de uh, federal government collects. Um, so we really felt there was a role for the government to play in terms of creating uh, much uh, more accurate and um, comprehensive information to inform a broad level of choice. So uh, a couple of years later, uh, we published the College Scorecard. Um, the College Scorecard contains really a wealth of information that had never been uh, released up until that point. So uh, while earnings measures had existed, really um, earnings measures on the scale uh, that was made possible by uh, the data effort that we undertook, which involved uh, upwards of 50 million 
um, students who had attended uh, institutions between you know, roughly the late 1990s and about 2010 or so, uh, and being able to track the earnings outcomes of all of those uh, students by looking at um, their, uh, their tax records um, through the IRS, uh, really provided this unprecedented uh, uh, new um, kind of uh, look into the outcomes of, of students. Now, uh, when we released all that information, that really um, uh, kind of taught us uh, a bunch of things that, um, that were really quite new. So we had all these new um, uh, data, data points on the outcomes of students across institutions, and um, this really led uh, us to question some of the other uh, kind of traditional measures of institutional quality that are out there. So some of the surprising findings that uh, kind of underlie uh, the College Scorecard project are um, the fact that the only really um, uh, kind of common measure of institutional quality, the graduation rate, uh, seems to not correlate very well with some of the um, earnings outcomes that you see across institutions, which is not to say that uh, we privilege one over the other, but uh, it led to these new questions about, um, you know, do we really think that graduation rates across uh, all institutions are a good proxy for quality, uh, given the disconnect that we see with some of these other uh, later life outcomes for students and so on. So that, that was uh, kind of one example of something that gave us pause in, in feeling like we really had a good handle now uh, on being able to fully rank the space of higher education institutions. So we, 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 um, we started to step away from the notion of producing a full summative measure of institutional quality based on the data that we had available. Um, another uh, kind of uh, uh, rationale behind that was just the fact that while we started by looking at a really wide number of measures to, uh, to track institutional performance, um, at the end of the day, earnings was one of the only things, earnings and completion rates were one of the only kind of sets of outcomes that we were really able to capture. Uh, and a lot of us felt that uh, that was just too limited a set mm. of data points to be able to capture the full range of what uh, institutions of higher education were really producing that was of value um, to the economy. So we'll get into a little bit more, I think, when we start to move into talking more about the pros and cons uh, of, uh, of uh, rating systems overall, uh, some of the other factors um, that were behind the federal government's decision to step back from uh, a full-blown uh, kind of comprehensive summary measure of institutional quality. Uh, but that's a little bit of a sense for uh, kind of what, under, uh, what underlay those decisions. And that's a segue to our next section, which is the intended consequences and, you know, why we're doing this, what the good thing about rankings are. Kim, do you want to start us off? So um, it's our belief that a well-designed ranking is a great consumer tool because uh, most 18-year-olds aren't really familiar with things like graduation rates or value-added graduation rates or student debt repayments. And so we grown-ups and experts, you know, collate all the data for them and crunch it and say, okay, um, you know, when we do our surveys of, of, of money readers, the answer, what they want from us often is just, they say, just tell us what to do, right? Sure. Make things simple for us. So a ranking does that, and when we crunch all the data, we can say, this is the school that has the best combination of affordability and high earnings and high quality education. So that's basically, we're trying to identify the schools that are the better choices. Um, one thing we've noticed is that if you're an elite student it really and you're choosing among the elite schools it really there isn't a lot of difference but if you're a second tier student there is very high variability in things like graduation rates and earnings so the rankings don't matter so much at the top level the number one through 25 or one through 30 but when you're choosing between number 100 and number 500 there's a huge difference and uh, really, rankings actually matter more for the B student than they, than they do for the A student, because that's where you see the great variation in price and student loan repayments and so on. And Rob? Yeah, I totally underscore uh, what Kim is saying. We've been very focused, clearly focused, for, for many years on this idea of finding a school that's going to be the best fit for us as students and certainly parents and counselors that are helping students along the, along the way. The way we've defined finding best fit is an academic fit, a campus culture fit, which is unapologetically a pretty big bucket, uh, and then financial aid fit, career service fit, and, and I, I love the idea of extending that definition to the idea of college ROI, which I know we're going to hit on uh, uh, today as well. Um, 
and it resonates with students. Uh, one of the things that we've been chatting about in, in preparation for this discussion, uh, we have a survey at Princeton Review called College Hopes and Worries, and we had several thousand students go through that in the last, last few, few years. It's an annual survey. And we found out that students and parents actually agreed on one thing, and that was their biggest worry around college admissions. And certainly, as Jordan was saying, and that biggest worry is around taking on debt for college. And then the second biggest worry is that students would get into their first choice schools, but families wouldn't be able to pay for it. So I think we, as rankers and aggregators of so much data, want to make sure that we are solving for some of those worries and directly trying to answer them in the form of rankings, ratings, narrative about schools so we can dig down into some of those, some of those specifics. Um, I think you can look to all of us uh, up here on the dais to continue to uh, fight the good fight of finding, finding fit in schools. Agreed. The other thing that it's important to mention too is all of us that are directly involved in these rankings consumed by consumers is they are iterative. We change them, we adapt them according to feedback we get from users so we can make them a more useful tool for people who are trying to find their best fit college. From Payscale's perspective, as I mentioned, we have focused on outcomes, earnings outcomes, and we had a lot of feedback from people who said, I went to a college because they have a really good education program and we know teachers don't earn that much and it's unfair for you to say my school's not a good school because of how teachers are paid. And we took that feedback and started building in what we measure as, uh, called job meeting and how much of a difference are you making in the world. So that people who were that that's important, they can focus on that measure. People where earnings are important, they can focus on that measure. So it's all about kind of finding this tweak, this personalization piece, which we'll touch on more later. I love that idea, if we could just comment really qu quickly on what Katie is saying, um, that idea of, of being able to be nimble enough to change uh, the data set that we're, that we're collecting, and that is one of the data points that we've found so valuable from, from Payscale for a Princeton Review student. We are kind of limited in surveying current college students about their experience, taking that information back to a college-bound population, but we kind of lose sight of students after they, after they graduate, and that's where I think the sort of delightful partnership that we have with Payscale in thinking about that data. But what I love is that it's also the qualitative data, thinking about that value of your undergraduate degree and, and where you are now. So in addition to rankings benefiting the students, they also benefit the schools as well. So obviously a school that ranks well, you know, they put it on their marketing and so on. And I mean, one, one of the things I'm proud of at Money is we, we look at a lot of, for example, value add. We, in other words, we subtract out the impact of let's say the percentage of students who are come from a low income or the uh, student's SAT score and we look at which schools do a good job with that with their particular population and as a result schools that may you may not have heard of um, come out very well in money's rankings because they take in they aren't the Ivy League they take in low income students or B students and they help them into great jobs and, and so on and so for example uh, in our first ranking in 2014 first modern ranking um, Babson came out as number one, and uh, the next year their applications were up 15 percent, their enrollment was up 5 percent, their SAT scores were up 6 percent, and their net tuition revenue was up more than a million dollars according to our estimate. So doing well on some of these new rankings can really benefit the school. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. I couldn't agree, agree more. Um, that idea of using rankings to either promote uh, that distinction through marketing information, through admissions office, uh, uh, content that folks are, folks are creating. You know, we put this last bullet point down there. As I said before, you know, I, I base the majority of our rankings on current student, student opinion. Uh, so I do, you know, are your professors good teachers? Do your professors bring the material that they teach in class to life? We talk about career services. Is the food good? Are the beds comfortable? And of course, uh, you know, is there an apologetically active social scene at a school for our top party school. Uh, this year, number one on our list of Prince Review is University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Urbana I am afraid to go to the city of Urbana-Champaign for publishing that, uh, that list, but we ask students. Uh, their rate of consumption of beer on campus on a daily basis, hard liquor consumption on a daily basis, drug consumption on a daily basis, hours of study spent outside the classroom, and then popularity of fraternities and sororities. Again, based on hundreds of thousands of students 
at, at schools answering these questions for their experience at that school and then putting that information out there. Um, some schools have taken it in stride saying, you know, as long as this is a place that you can work hard and play hard, it's fine with us. We heard that from the LSU chancellor a couple years ago. Um, but many college presidents and, and other admissions uh, brass or other brass at schools may tend to discredit uh, the way that we go about creating uh, rankings information from that student survey. Happy to engage, uh, you know, certainly uh, up here and then privately afterwards, uh, should you want to talk about it more. Great. The other point worth mentioning, too, is that the rankings can be cut in so many different ways that most schools can often find some positive spin on the rankings. You know, best religious school in Massachusetts that serves under 1,000 people, mm -hmm. for example. So, and because we have this wealth of data and because the government gives us so many different ways that we can cut the school populations based on their, their level of urbanness, Princeton Review has party schools and all various factors around as well, that there's just a kind of a ranking for everybody. I think the, the one thing that I'd add to that is another um, uh, kind of way that these kinds of uh, performance uh, information systems, if, if we can view uh, ranking systems in that way, the, the way that they help schools that the administration was really focused on was in providing information to the schools uh, so they could um, inform their own quality improvement measures, so really to be able to use the information that we were providing uh, to be able to do benchmarking studies to figure out within uh, a state system, for example, where um, you know, we were quite active in, in talking to people and within a state system, why, why are some institutions, um, um, uh, graduates having particularly high earnings um, into being able to, to try to identify the top performers and really try to identify the set of institutions that um, uh, an institution looking to improve could really look to as a model um, for promising strategies to try to improve. So I think there's that um, aspect for how the, in the information can really help to benefit schools as well. Agreed. Yep. I was just thinking of an example of um, a way in which the rankings can sort of set benchmarks for best practices uh, that colleges can live up to. And one of the things that we do at Money is we include uh, whether or not the, a college has a specific program to connect uh, job-seeking students with alumni working in a field, their aspirational field, which is a great thing. I mean, colleges should have that. So if a college doesn't have that, they get you know a few less points on our ranking system. So. Set, by setting that as a standard, um, then we can encourage schools to do things that are, are good for the students and are good for the alumni, frankly. Now we'll talk about the bad or the unintended consequences of doing rankings. Right, so there was a very interesting re report that came out recently that found that schools that fell in the U.S. News rankings, which is a prestige ranking, um, the next year they tended to raise their tuition because of, possibly because of a principle known as the Chivas Regal effect, which is um, I guess there's a certain whiskey that's not that good, but it's very expensive, and since it's expensive, I don't know, I actually don't know anything about whiskey. Is Chivas Regal good? I don't know. So I, I, maybe it's great, I don't know. Um, uh, anyway, but the perception is if it's expensive, it must be good. So in some rankings, the unintended consequence is that um, socially less desirable, desirable behaviors are created as schools try to rise in the rankings. Um, we've also had many situations, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, with um, some schools maybe inflating their SAT scores or they're inflating their, um, you know, the, their selectivity rates just to rise, especially in the U.S. news rankings. And there's something, has anybody ever heard of Tufts syndrome? It's an actual thing, uh, which is a school that encourages people to apply just so that they can reject them, um, so that they'll look more selective. Um, and I'm also concerned about schools that, uh, you know, that use selectivity and high SAT uh, scores uh, to rise in the rankings, therefore they won't, uh, you know, they, they don't provide access. And, and there's some, several examples of that, and I'll, I'll pass this on. Yeah, I, I think, and I to totally hear what Kim is saying, the idea of rankings fatigue, and we were talking about this as a, as a group as well, uh, particularly in the, in the slide that Katie put up that, you know, from the mid-1980s till, till now, uh, it's no secret there are many, many more college rankings. And the idea of rankings fatigue, if you are the average college-bound student or parent or guidance counselor or college counselor helping them along the way, how do you filter for a college rankings that's of, a college ranking that is of substance and one that might be more clickbait. And, and I think that that is the biggest challenge for, for us. Many of us think that we're doing uh, good work and substantive work and, and, and that 
we create things that have value and that our methodology is clear, uh, but I think it is difficult sometimes for the average student and family to be able to filter for, for those things. We were talking about some, some folks that are creating college rankings every day, and I get an email in my inbox, nine o'clock every morning, on a new college ranking. Um, I, I think that underscores the idea of fatigue, and I would be fine with that uh, if I believe that the rankings were of substance, but I, I, I think that um, it is difficult to create a college list every, every day. Um, <laughs> uh, we can agree to disagree on that, but I'm hoping that that comes up in the Q&A as well. Yeah. yeah, something we want to add too is we were actually here presenting at South by Southwest last year with a college net talking about the social mobility index and, and basically how oftentimes schools are just not, they're underserving the, the people who are from lower income brackets or from those kind of families. And some of the feedback we heard from people in that session is they are guidance counselors responsible for more than 10 or 20 schools in a given, a d given district. So it's just impossible for them to disseminate this kind of information to the people who could value it most. Yeah. I mean, and just to look at those numbers, just to underscore what Katie is saying, I know we have, we have college counselors and guidance counselors in the audience, and we know our jobs are tough as counselors, right? It's 470 students to every one counselor nationally. In California, that's 1,000 students to every one counselor. Uh, you know, and, and many of those counselors are both college counselors as well as social counselors, so you're juggling so many things. I, I think many of us believe that we're trying to make that college process for counselors that are advising so many students as navigable as possible and to give resources that would be valuable there certainly not charging for those, for those resources. I, I produce a book with many rankings in it, a $24 book, uh, but we put all that information on our website for free for students, parents, counselors, uh, any interested party. And I'm proud that we're able to do that uh, at Princeton Review and, and many of our other services, certainly Scorecard. Uh, this data is accessible for us to, to use to help navigate. I would add the, the, another aspect of this. I mean, I, I think uh, in terms of the technical uh, kind of side of trying to produce rankings like this, I, I think the, the hardest two uh, issues and the two issues that we struggled most with this uh, when, we were, when I was working on it within the administration was on the one hand, um, uh, avoiding uh, kind of creating a teaching to the test kind of uh, phenomenon. So uh, meaning we, we come up with a few different measures of college performance and all of a sudden institutions have a huge incentive to try to look good on those dimensions of performance. In, in the issue is, as I, I said uh, in the intro, just that we have so few uh, measures at the federal level anyway, uh, of uh, kind of measures of performance uh, aside from measures of labor market success. Mm -hmm. And for us, that was uh, just a real, there was just a real concern that, um, you know, uh, ranking institutions based on that narrow set of measures was going to lead to a narrowing of the curriculum, perhaps institutions substituting away from an emphasis on uh, instruction in areas that were lower paid, where, where um, graduates tended to earn uh, less over time as a way of uh, increasing their measured performance. I mean, the more general phenomenon is that it's always much easier for an institution or generally easier for an institution to control um, the, uh, how they look on these um, measures of performance by altering the mix of students that they bring in. Um, so kind of taking people who are kind of interested in uh, studying in programs that lead to higher earnings or perhaps um, uh, not uh, kind of taking as many low income students or students who may be less prepared and who are likely to have lower incomes as a result. So I think that there's a real challenge in how to have the ratings try to net out uh, factors like that um, so that you can avoid incentivizing institutions to engage in this behavior that might ultimately undermine access or again um, lead to kind of counterproductive changes amongst institutions. The only other point to add too is our last bullet point is Poorly designed rankings can hurt students, but they can also hurt schools. Just like a good ranking can raise a school up, a bad ranking can bring it down. And, and whether that ranking is fairly representing what that school's mission is, is open for debate and depends on the ranking overall. So now let's talk about the future of rankings. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, as I was saying before, folks, we, we do a survey at Prince Review called College Hopes and Worries. It's an annual survey. Now this is our 13th year uh, doing it. And I, I talk to lots of college-bound students and their families on an annual basis. I'm on the road a little over 70% of the, over the year talking to students and, and parents and, and of course guidance counselors and college counselors. And I do an exercise with, with, with students and I say, okay, um, 
I want you to write down the names of three colleges or universities that you would love to see yourself at as a college freshman. And then I ask parents to do the same thing, but with two caveats. It doesn't matter if you don't have a prayer in heaven to get into those schools academically or two nickels to rub together to pay for it. And, uh, and I give them 30 seconds to write down the schools and then I ask them to keep their pens in their, in their hands and then to cross off the following schools. And we cross off all the Ivy League schools and then no more than 20 schools cumulatively. And then I asked to see who still has three schools left on their list. And almost always, it's crickets. Two schools left, one school left. And we know that so many students, uh, smart, accomplished, thoughtful, well-educated, parents, students, counselors, so many of them fall into that trap of focused on, focusing on perception only. But I was so heartened by the survey results that we have up here and saying that when students are pushed just a little bit, college bound students and their parents, what they're, what they're answering is that academic reputation is really a very small piece of the pie. What really matters is fit, as we've been talking about, and career interests. So the idea of career services, return on your investment, internships, cooperative experiences, experiential learning, the things that we as counselors and educators talk about all the time. And what I love is that there's parity now this year between those career interests and, and best fit. And those of us who've been working in college education or higher ed for a long time know that five years ago, it would have been difficult for a typical college-bound student to ask about ROI, to ask about many of the things that Kim and her team are creating every day. And, and, that, and I am heartened that that exists. And I am grateful that those students and parents are asking tough questions of admissions folks and talking about those careers after interest in finding fit. So the, what I see is, as we, as Katie mentioned, we are iterative every year. We try to improve them, and you know, people like Jordan give us great new data that we can use, which is thank you very much. Um, so the big themes I see are more new and better data, <clears throat> focusing on the things that people actually care about, such as outcomes, such as career services, and so on, um, and personalization. Um, this whole idea that you know, Harvard is not the best school for everybody. Um, the ability to personalize the data, personalize the rankings to yourself to find your best fit. That's something that we're working on and I know everybody else is working on as well. Um, and also the focus, we're especially focusing on value add analyses, which is um, taking out the impact of, uh, you know, just, uh, just let's say the academic preparation of the student and seeing which schools actually do a better job given their mission, given their population. So, um, and the final point is, is cost, is, is looking at the true net cost. As, as I know, you, you probably know, something like 80% of students at private colleges don't pay the sticker price. I mean, so we really need to look at the net cost that people are paying for colleges and what that ROI is. In terms of pay scale, what we are really focusing on is just expanding the outcome data that we have available. So when we first started, we just focused on typical median earnings across schools, all graduates, regardless of major. Then the next year, we improved that by looking at specific years of experience buckets to kind of get at early career people, mid career people. And then in a more recent time, we've been looking at, well, what if we cut it by major and school? It's not necessarily where you go to school, but what you major in at that school. So calling out the fact that if you go and major in psychology, it matters actually if you went to Harvard. There's a little bit more name brand recognition there. But if you major in engineering, you could go to a ton of schools that are not as expensive and still, still do quite well for yourself just because of the job market you face. When we're looking towards the future, some of the additional things we want to add in is, is kind of quantifying the more qualitative measures of uh, various feelings about how they, how they enjoyed their school, would they recommend it to people who are now choosing school, were they satisfied with their education experience, and then also further looking at it as, as best as we can by income level of peop, uh, people's households when they went to school. To try and get at that concept of when you're looking at return on investment, it's not the same dollar that can be applied to everybody, also because of net cost, but also because of where they come from. And it's that growth that you can see in your income from getting a college education that one should really focus on. I completely applaud that, that idea of looking at majors attached to the colleges and starting salaries in those things. I and mean, just for us in this c collective group today, we never had that kind of data when we were looking at schools. If we were going to major in education or in engineering or in poli sci, to now have the median starting salary, or, or I'm sorry, that, that's the wrong nomenclature, but that starting salary data attached to majors at schools that you're considering when you're, when you're thinking of uh, you know, that universe of schools and going through the college process. That's needed data that, that 
just wasn't accessible to us. And I think that as we are all moving in that new direction of thinking about what those outcomes are, I, I love that idea of tying the majors to, to schools and that salary. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Some of the, sorry, one of the pieces that we always talk about is because of this rising cost of tuition, because it is skyrocketing, if you have a general idea of the field that you want to go into, we're providing you this measure so you can understand, well, what sort of costs will I incur, as well as what expected income can I receive? So not saying that income is the end-all, be-all of why you should choose a given college, but just to better inform people when they're making those choices. Just if I could pick up on that, I mean, I think one of the exciting uh, kind of new directions for this kind of work is really the capacity with kind of new sources of big data like, like a pay scale, but also uh, at the state level, state uh, administrative systems increasingly as a result of um, some of the efforts um, behind, um, uh, behind um, uh, the administration's efforts to get um, states to develop more longitudinal data systems that link um, their students' K-12 data with their students' higher ed data with labor market outcomes. There's really unprecedented ability now uh, in the states. Texas is an example of a state with an amazing data architecture for this kind of work to match students as a function of the, um, their strengths in high school, for example, as, as you can see on their high school transcript, uh, uh, who end up going to various different kinds of colleges to see how well different colleges are educating students with different uh, career interests, with different levels of academic preparation and so on and so this idea of kind of customizing the ranking to really give each student a very personalized forecast of what their uh, outcomes would look like as a function of which uh, institution they attend uh, is really coming into to a new era of possibilities because of the availability of all this new data. So, you know, within administrative systems, there is this limitation that a lot of what's available is just labor market success and so on, and that's where I think, um, you know, measures like um, the job meaning that Payscale collects or what um, Gallup is collecting in terms of um, uh, kind of life satisfaction, subjective measures of that, uh, really add a lot more nuance in, in the kinds of um, student surveys that Princeton Review is conducting really um, allows you to flesh those things out in so much greater detail um, than it's been possible in the past. So on this slide, we've proposed some ways that rankings can be improved. Uh, the main focus on this is just kind of better data on things that we are all have of interest. We've all been discussing, and we'll talk about it a little bit more here. But for the Q and A session, we definitely would welcome anyone who wants who wants to contribute any other thoughts out, you know, around data or around other pieces that uh, to can improve the rankings for everybody. I, I would just want to add just personalization and, and one thing that we're really focusing increasingly on is <clears throat> moving beyond data to actual humanity, human touch, <laughs> uh, because as we mentioned, we, we all know that uh, so many people are don't have access to a, a, a college counselor in their high school and, and money is par partnering with the uh, an association of college counselors to give our, our premium members a free access to, to someone who's actually going to hold their hand through the process. So. I think that we have to move beyond just data and, and move, you know, get, get beyond data into a human touch to help people make sense of the data and reassure them in this very stressful process. So I think that would be the even more future step. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree as well. We, and I love the idea of personalization. Um, we are approaching it in a couple of different ways at Princeton Review. We have our first uh, college search uh, mobile app that just, just came out in January. Uh, much of this data, again, is available on our website and books, but the idea of aggregating you know, many of the different uh, data points that come from individual projects that we can look at on the website, but then talking to 16 and 17 year olds, they're, they're, they're not going to our website in the, in the numbers that they were in years past, but they are going to mobile apps and other platform that might be more accessible to, to those students. Many parents and counselors are still moving on to either our retail products or, or um, you know, certainly the content that lives, uh, lives up on our website. But I, just to underscore this idea of personalization, as I said, I spend a lot of time on the road talking to students and parents, and i convinced I visit more colleges than any other person on the planet. And I was at a school in, uh, in Virginia this past year who had not done well on our um, diversity ranking list, specifically do diverse students actually interact with one another. So I go down uh, to the school and I make a formal visit and I'm supposed to spend some time with their president and some administrators and some students and, and some faculty members. And these two very earnest undergraduates take me out on tour and they blow past their time for an hour. And I'm on the tour for almost two hours with these folks. And I said, guys, we have to, we have to get back to, to you know, the 
regular schedule. I said, but you haven't discussed anything about diversity on campus. I said, you know, we've been critical of, of you in this Princeton Review ranking list. Can you speak about diversity? But it could be ethnic, political, religious, uh, you know, keep the lens wide. And this one young woman that was on the tour that you know, was touring us, she says, oh, Rob, we're really diverse. We have students from both the North and the South. <laughs> and when we think about those things, we, we need to know, right, as an enlightened collective today and the many students that we advise and parents that we interact with, um, that different things are going to be of varying degrees of importance. So, so we might uh, want to make sure, and I think that this is where we're all moving, to make sure that we're creating well, one, we're mining data and aggregating data in an intelligent way, but making it accessible to students, parents, and counselors. And that is the trifecta of folks that we are trying to influence. Uh, sometimes, as we were talking about before, I don't make every college president happy, uh, you know, nor do any folks that make rankings, but, um, but they're not our audience, right? The folks who are our audience are students, parents, and counselors. And uh, I, again, we're happy to talk about those things, but I think we're all pretty aligned on that as well. The only ad additional thing that I want to add from Payscale's perspective is similar to the personalization thing that money's working towards is we're, we're working in that same vein. So we release a college return on investment report in the spring and we faced a lot of um, criticism because typically the cost that we've provided is the sticker price cost or we do do a net cost but only accounting for grant aid. Uh, and so we're working with some partners to provide a way to calculate a cost that's unique to a person's given situation, their income, the loan rates they're getting and, and so on because ROI, the number that you get, is essentially meaningless if it doesn't take into consideration the cost that you yourself pay. Mm -hmm. So it'll give that more of that personalization aspect when it comes to the actual uh, financial outcomes that you can expect. Okay, so I think we're gonna move to the Q&A session, so bear with me for a moment while I um, switch our uh, screen. So our first question comes from Mark. Considering how few students attend top universities as a percent across higher ed, how much do rankings really matter to the average student and institution? Right, so I totally agree with this, which is why we changed, we developed our methodology not to reward just the elite schools. Um, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the schools that rank well, very well here in Texas, and I hesitate to say this here in Austin, but yeah. is uh, Texas A&M actually ranks better than UT. Uh, because it has a lower cost and um, lower debt, debt loads for its, for its graduates. Um, but yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you and we're, one of the reasons we've developed our methodology was to highlight the more accessible schools that are doing a great job. So. I could jump in on this. I mean, I, I think it's such an important issue. Um, it, almost all of the, the ranking systems that are out there, regardless of whether they focus on the top or not, often leave out information about the two-year college sector where, mm -hmm. you know, as the second question here points to traditional or non-traditional students as well. Such, such a growing area and where so many low-income students um, start, if not finish, uh, their education. And so I do think there's, there's really a huge benefit for more information to uh, be out there uh, that pertains to um, that kind of segment uh, of, the, of the higher education sector. I mean, I think a lot of the benefit of education can really be, or sorry, a lot of the benefit of the information can really be about uh, helping students to avoid really bad choices because um, if there's one thing that, um, that the, the kind of run up of um, uh, student debt and uh, enrollment, particularly in the for-profit sector, uh, kind of taught us over the, the last six years or so was that th there really are some bad choices out there for students in terms of institutions that really saddle students with a lot of debt without uh, kind of providing commensurate uh, benefits. So, so I think there, there are huge returns to more information in that sector. The issue is just that uh, students in that sector generally are not the students who are out there um, kind of buying these um, kind of ranking publications or going online to do a lot of research about their college options. And I think that's where um, kind of really um, pr providing information through counselors and, and other kind of supplements to uh, co college counselors is so important. Yeah. Oh, oh. I just, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just uh, I was just thinking about one of the things we do is we we highlight a list called the most value added colleges and um, these are the schools that take in you know more disadvantaged kids and do a really great job with them and I you know, one school that just keeps on popping on our list is is a school called Robert Morris University of Illinois they, their average student has a C plus grad, uh, GPA in high school and they graduate 80 percent of those students which is more than twice what similar schools 
taking in similar students you know, do. So, I mean, yes, absolutely, you know, we should be honoring these schools that are giving students opportunities, and we should be highlighting them, and, and that's one thing that, that money is doing. Uh, Mark, just to answer your question from the Princeton Review side of the fence, I think that rankings uh, are more valuable for students that are not applying to uh, uh, the most competitive schools in the country. I think we'd all probably agree that we're not writing a, you know, a book or a publication or a website about the Ivies, right? I mean, those are right, as Kim said before, for many students, but certainly not all students. And, and, and I think that us casting a wider lens on that idea of fit in the categories that we talked about is crucial for those students that might not be applying to the most competitive schools in the country. And then underscoring those schools uh, that are doing, you know, Robert Morris, University of Dayton, uh, George Washington University, awesome school, certainly competitive school is number one on our best internships. You know, they have more interns uh, in DC from GW than any other school in America. So when you start to think about widening the lens and giving substance to those schools that might not always make it onto the top of our list of three schools, um, then I feel like those rankings are, are, are doing what they're intended to do, which is to give value to those schools that are doing a superlative job. And from Payscale's perspective, I agree wholeheartedly. We produce outcomes for over a thousand different universities. So, you know, only about 15 of those are those kind of eight IVs and the other notable uh, public IVs. Um, so it's the information is out there. And as Jordan mentioned or reiterated, it's just getting it into the hands of the right people. That is the part we really need to focus on now. In fact, I would say the rankings are more, as, as Rob said, I would echo that, uh, the rankings are more important for the B and C students, because if you're an A plus student and you have your choice of the Ivies or Stanford or Duke, it really doesn't matter. You know, all those schools have a 90% graduation rate. They all do great jobs. But if you're a B or a C student, it really, really matters where you go to school. Some schools will have an 80% graduation rate, and some schools that you're also eligible for will have a 40% graduation rate. So the rankings matter more to the B student and the C student than they do to the A student. If I could just come back to a thing that I said earlier about, you know, I think uh, amongst um, especially first generation college going students, there, there's not really this sensibility around um, there being a lot of uh, kind of consequence to which college you attend. Uh, you know, we, we got so many letters from people um, in the White House uh, who said, you know, I did everything right. I went to college, um, you know, I kind of went through all the steps to get into college and so on. Um, but there's just not this this sensibility that um, you know some colleges are really good and some colleges aren't, uh, or that the value of, or the the quality uh, can really can differ a great deal across different colleges. So uh, I, I do think you know part of the reason for that is that there just has not been a lot of information uh, about schools that provide certificates or provide two-year degrees uh, and so on. There, there just really is a lack of information about the outcomes mm -hmm. of, of those institutions, and so it's really hard. Um, you know, it's hard to even expect people to have that sense without that information being out there. So I, I do think that's one area where um, more information can be really helpful. Like I've said before, the, the data in the scorecard is a start in that direction, but I think more needs to be done. Great. That actually brings us to our next question. Nice segue. Uh, is it possible to create rankings that fit the needs of non-traditional college students since they are the majority? Yes, it is possible. It's something we're thinking about. We haven't done it yet. It's hard enough to do <laughs> what we're doing now, but it's definitely something we're thinking about. Yeah, yeah and I, I agree as well. And, and just thinking, about, I'm an old, old admissions guy as well, uh, and I love the idea. My favorite students to work with were non-traditional students, whether they were transfer students, returning students, um, older students, if you were outside of traditional college age. They were the most joyous group to work with because they were pragmatic in the way that they were going about the college process, right? They had already had an experience likely at another school uh, years before, or just that past year, and they were focused on what was going to be important to, again, to get their undergraduate degree. Uh, I, I would encourage the person that asked this question, I think that many of the rankings that we are already creating could be a great value to that non-traditional students simply because they are so pragmatic, particularly the ideas around career services, cooperation cooperative learning, internships, uh, and then thinking about where students are going afterwards in, in jobs and particular careers. 
Yeah, agreed. And, and when it comes to pay scale data, we actually are including all graduates of a given school, regardless of whether they were first time, uh, first enrollees, part time, transfer, any of that. They're all included in the data that we are putting out there. And I think we can be doing more to call, call out the differences across those so people can see if I am part time versus full time or if I do transfer in versus start here first year. I think there's plenty of opportunity there. And, and as we said earlier, the nice thing about this kind of data world that we live in is things are iterative. They can change. We can adjust to kind of the changing climate and the changing landscape. Yeah. So our next question from Matt. What is measured will drive goals. Please speak to how you are working to prevent negative outcomes of rankings. Recruiting to deny, drowning bunnies, etc. <laughs> so um, about a third of the weight of the money rankings is based on these so-called value-added measures, which is how well a school performs uh, after subtracting out the impact of the percentage of students who receive the Pell Grant or their average SAT scores. So in other words, there is no advantage. A school that only takes in high-level high students can't really add value because you can't graduate more than 100% of your students, right? So a school like Washington University in St. Louis, which is notoriously not diverse and not providing opportunity, does not rank very well at money. Um, a school that inflates its SAT scores will do poorly with the, on the money rankings because it won't have any room to add value. So one of the things we think that by, by weighting heavily value added, we're actually rewarding the schools to provide opportunities, get those students to graduation, and get them into good jobs. So we think we're fixing the incentive problem, the perverse incentive problem. And the, the way that we're approaching this, and I so appreciate the question, Matt, uh, is I'm, I'm hoping that the breadth of, of rankings content that we, that we have, again, based on that qualitative student opinion, is going to hopefully create some positive change rather than, rather than negative. I totally hear what Kim is saying in regards to you know, admissions practices. We've been, as I've been saying, focused very clearly on, on giving that student voice so that there could be a fair representation of what that student is experiencing academically and otherwise. Uh, and, and what we've seen for many of those things is that they're being great and positive change. I mean, as little as, you know, a, a school might be on a list that, you know, their food service is poor. And then, you know, in a couple of years, there's a new food service vendor or a new dining hall on campus. We've seen those same things with gay issues on campus, diversity issues on campus. Uh, and the list goes on. I'm, I'm hoping that that can be um, at least in part an answer to your question, but I appreciate it. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that by rankings focusing on outcomes and experiences while you're in school rather than the, the inputs to get into a given school, that's the other large improvement of, of making sure that you're not driving these kind of negative outcomes. Okay, our next question is how do college rankings help those high school students who are not planning on attending college in the first place? So I think that by um, highlighting the schools that take in the C plus or C minus students <laughs> and showing that kids can succeed even if they didn't uh, su succeed at a, a great school even though they may not have done that well in high school, I think that that actually is an encouraging uh, message and, and one that people need to hear. So I, I think that by emphasizing these value add schools, I think that we're actually helping those students. I think another big part of this is, is one of the big barriers that, that um, keeps students from even applying to school is just a misperception about the cost for them. Yeah. Um, so, so especially lower income students who worry that they're not going to be able to afford this. Just being able to provide information about um, the difference between um, the sticker price that a college might list on its website and what they'll actually receive net of the grants that they're likely to receive at an institution is such an important part of things. So, you, you know, uh, uh, information like what money puts out, like what's on the, the college scorecard that really has um, detailed information on net um, costs, so the costs that you'd get after um, getting financial aid, and especially having that information tailored uh, to a student's circumstance uh, is really, uh, really a big part of um, how you, the information can really help to convey to some students that what they thought was unattainable really could be within reach. I have nothing else to add. I agree. Yeah, the only other thing that I'd add from Payscale's perspective is, is we, we have done work to highlight uh, people who go down a vocational path as well, because I think it's important to mention that college is not made for everybody. So having an understanding of if you don't go to college, what are some of the other options I have and what are the earnings associated with those as well. So I think uh, similar to any of the rankings information we've talked about, it's just making sure we get the right information in the right hands at the right time. 
Uh, since rankings can impact a school's applicant pool, can rankings incentivize schools to invest in areas that aren't aligned to students' needs? Mm. I think yeah, you all say absolutely. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think yes, we're all probably in, a, in agreement here. I, and again, thinking about what we've all been talking about, the value of the ranking that is out there. I think that we all uh, are very clear that we're creating rankings of substance, that many schools will use those, use those rankings appropriately, um, but that we have um, a job, a duty to make sure that we're putting this information out there in a real way and that we're clear about our, uh, our, our methodology. Right, and, and one thing Rob does, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, is survey the students. So you're reflecting, it may be not the students' needs, but their desires, Correct. right? Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. The famous example of the climbing wall or something. Right. <laughs> or better food, like, okay, so the college spends more on a better cafeteria. They didn't need it, but it does ex improve their experience. So, you know, I mean, the, the colleges do need to recruit students and whether or not we rank, they're going to do things to recruit those students, you know, so. Certainly. So it's not just us that's creating the perverse incentives. So. Right, right. So say just on this topic, it's, it's worth um, con considering what happens in the absence of information. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in the absence of information, people are still making choices. And I think, um, you know, there's a fair amount of research in the social sciences that in, in the absence of information about the performance of institutions, um, you know, parents will choose based on um, uh, kind of the characteristics of the students who are going there. So in the sense that uh, I might choose to send my kids where like other people like me have sent their kids and so on. And that, that can really encourage, I mean, that also has the property of encouraging, um, you know, very affluent families all to try to select um, schools, to select the same sets of schools and so on. So it's, it's not obvious. Um, kind of ex ante that this kind of information is exacerbating a problem because even in the absence right. of the information, um, there, there are forces that push in this direction. Great. Okay, your next question, Jordan. <laughs> How do you get access to graduate tax return data for salaries? Are U.S. tax returns public? Um, so, so uh, no, they're not public, uh, um, and, uh, and we didn't uh, rely on uh, any data that was um, hacked. Uh, uh, and made public uh, or anything like that. The, the, the information is all um, um, uh, kind of computed within the confines of the IRS. So, so basically what happens is that uh, rosters of students who had attended particular institutions are um, sent within the IRS. Uh, information uh, is then computed within the IRS at an aggregate level um, so that no uh, kind of individual level taxpayer information is ever um, kind of disclosed in the process. So essentially, uh, a list of um, students' names uh, and identifying information is, is sent within IRS and they return uh, things like uh, the average uh, or median uh, earnings information of students uh, who attended a particular institution in a particular year uh, with disclosure protections put in place. So, uh, you know, for example, if there are fewer than 100 um, students in an institution in a particular year, then um, uh, the IRS wouldn't return any information uh, in situations like that. Great, so we are out of time. So uh, the four of us will be up here for a little bit if you wanted to come and exchange contact information. If there's questions you had, you didn't feel you had a chance to get answered, definitely come and see us over here in this corner. But otherwise, we really appreciate you being here and, and being involved in our panel. Thank you. Thank you.